welcome to the podcast. This is this is a real treat for me. I know I say that a lot, people. I'm sorry. I edit myself and I was like, you say that all the time. If everything's a real treat, Cena, that means nothing's a treat. But this is actually a real treat because <laughs> this is not that the other times aren't a real treat. I'm gonna get out of this hole that I'm digging for myself. But the I'm here <laughs> with I'm here with the trio of kings, absolute social media kings behind Midwest Midwestern marks. Uh, the 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 leftist internet sensation, uh, Eddie, Carlos, and Alex. Can you take a second to each introduce yourselves, and uh, we'll 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 get into the secondary question about a bit of biography afterwards. But just to get a sense of who's who. Well, I'm Alex Zambito. I, I run uh, Southern Marxist. I run Southern Marxist on Instagram. Um, I'm a graduate student in history at uh, Brooklyn College. Uh, I'm Carlos Garrido. I. Um... I kickstarted uh, Midwest Remarks with, with Eddie. I'm currently a uh, graduate student and professor in philosophy at Southern Illinois University. Yeah, I'm Eddie, founded Midwestern Marks with Carlos, um, and obviously Alex was one of the very first people we brought on board. I am going to get my graduate degree in healthcare administration next year and coach in wrestling, and yeah. So, uh, boys, you guys, I have to say, from the very outset, you guys run an extremely impressive social media machine, okay? Not only do you have like, I mean, yeah, a lot of people have followers, a lot of people have big accounts, like it's not a rare thing and not, you know, that in itself is not an accomplishment. However, what you guys are doing, talking about Marxism, talking about communism, talking about Stalin, talking about all of the like red flag issues of, of American life, liberalism, the right wing, it's such an anti-communist country. I mean, we'll get to that in a second, but I, I just want to sort of lay that out there and be like, I'm super like, I learned from you guys, how you guys play the game, how you guys sort of get your message out, how you work it. And I actually want to get into that during this conversation. Like, I want to pick your brain a little bit, how you guys approach it. But in the meantime, maybe each of you can take a turn talking about how you came to Marxism and kind of the, maybe something that really inspired you and sort of brought you, brought you to the movement and to the ideas, Karl Marx. Let's start with Carlos. Sure. Carlos, you want to go first since you're kind of the one who introduced me to it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, whether it's Marxism or social democracy or whatever position that uh, claims itself, uh, whether it is in reality or not is relevant, but whether that it claims itself to be against the status quo and, and the rule of capital, to get to these positions, I feel like an event is required. in philosophy. An event is something that happens that breaks the everydayness of someone's life. And for me, that event was when my mother had my little sister and she was faced with the question of either getting operated for a medical condition that she developed um, and, and going into insurmountable debt or saying, can we curse? Can we yes, curse on of the course. Podcast? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Or saying fuck it and and rolling with it, and she had to say fuck it because we we couldn't accumulate the sort of debt that would have came about from that. And I, I was very young when this took place. I, I never understood it, and I especially never understood it because the people around us who were um, anti-communist uh, gusanos were constantly telling her, "Just go to Cuba and have the operation." And I was just like, I mean, I was perhaps. 10 i was like this makes no sense this is like the richest country everyone's always hyping this country up why would my mom have to go to cuba to get an operation especially why would people who hate cuba tell her to do that so when bernie sanders comes about my senior year of high school it really started to provide certain answers that um that that event had left uh there you know those questions had been there from that event and Eventually, I go into the school to hopefully one day study law, which is what my parents had, had done. And I take the route of philosophy for practicality's sake. Um, and I fall in love with philosophy. I have uh, to Wait a minute. So philosophy was the where... practicality? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, in the sense of uh, I did philosophy for practical reasons for the LSAT. Because uh, philosophers test oh, the best on I the see. LSAT. And that was still I the see. plan that point so they're like oh you want to do uh law i guess study philosophy and they fucked up when they did that because i instantly fell in love it felt you know i still use the reference that it felt like when you go to the gym and you get a pump but it was just in the brain 
So mm -hmm. um, I had that experience and I was lucky enough to, to go through uh, a school where most of the philosophy professors I engaged with were uh, socialists. Uh, the political science classes I took and the sociology classes I took were uh, given to me mostly by Marxists. Um, and, you know, my own reading, which has probably been like 75 or 80 percent of what has caused the development outside of the institution, has led me to uh, Marxism or a Marxist-Leninist uh, position. I've continued the path of philosophy, as I mentioned. I'm still a graduate student, but that's, uh, that's sort of how I got to it. I had a personal experience and then uh, theoretical development. How about you, Eddie? Yeah, I agree with what Carlos said there um, about the event that pushes you either into being, you know, a social democrat, which is what's considered radical in the U.S. Um, or the West even, um, or that pushes you towards being a communist. And for me, I was like a freshman in high school or maybe in, in middle school, seventh or eighth grade, um, growing up in Wisconsin. And my dad was a teacher um, and Scott Walker decided to crush the teachers unions and, and give a $5,000 or so pay cut to the teachers in order to, you know, quote unquote, fix the debt. And then he turned around and gave a, a it was either four, yeah, a $4.4 .4 billion subsidy to Foxconn this giant multinational corporation. And now today, Wisconsin's debt is something like uh, 21 or $22 billion. Um, so of course, you know, fixing the debt is always this nonsense that the Republicans give us when they want to cut social programs or, or, or politicians in general give us when they want to cut social programs. So that was really obvious um, from the outset. Uh, um, for me there, I knew my dad was a hard worker. I knew the teachers worked really hard. Um, yet I was hearing that they were lazy and they were soaking up all the state's money and they were the reason we were in debt. Yet my family was was poor as my dad was a teacher. Um, so that got me into politics, decided to study it in college, uh, met Carlos while we were doing the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, obviously watched the primary be rigged against Bernie in real time, um, not once, but twice, you know, and in 2020. Uh, that was a very interesting experience actually being part of the campaign. Um, and then during that Bernie campaign in 2020 was when I was introduced into Marxism. I uh, started reading a lot of Lenin, and I felt like a lot of the stuff Lenin was saying, I wish I would have read before the Bernie campaign. So I was like, this dude told us electoral politics wouldn't work, and we had to organize workers and you know have a revolutionary movement. Like, why didn't I read this guy first before Bernie? But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, we're all on our own progression there. But, yeah, that's how I ended up with uh, with Marx. Uh, for me, I'm from a, so I'm from a military town in um, well, in Georgia. And I think kind of part of me, part of it for me, like a huge part of my development was um, just like developing opposition to like the Iraq war. Just being like from such like a military environment. I went to uh, an all boys military Catholic school, high school, and um, just like kind of. A huge formative thing for me was just kind of like slowly developing an opposition to the Iraq war and kind of like developing anti-imperialism and having um so like my my um ROTC instructor basically um listed his war crimes <laughs> to us in class so like that sort of stuff and I was like the only person sitting there like uh is this like a problem for anybody else uh this is kind of an issue for me but um so it's kind of like a developing uh you know a and opposition to like U.S. empire was like a huge uh, formative thing for me in my politics. And then um, also just like driving through like Georgia, you'll be like uh, in middle of Georgia and there's like a lot of poverty, especially like rural poverty. And then you'll just, uh, get to Atlanta and be in the middle of Buckhead and be like in the middle of all this opulence and just kind of like that super obvious contrast between those two things was like kind of a huge like uh, formative thing for me. Right. And it's it's so interesting to listen to the three of you and all three of you have your own kind of form material realities that that gave rise to these conditions that like got you to become to reach to Marxism or at least for Marxism to kind of make sense to you. Because at least in in the case in the case of sort of like your typical American person like Eddie, like Midwestern person, you are under like some of the most radically like generations of anti-communist ideological sort of pushing, right? So we call it like Cold War over here, like, oh, the Cold War was in full swing, which is kind of a neutral way of putting it. But really, we're talking about like three, four generations, or like maybe even five of hardcore anti-communist, like anti-communist sort of ideological kind of force playing out at every single level. This is the third of three films in which I have been talking to you about communism and socialism. In this one, 
I'm going to answer the question that is often asked me, what can we do about it? Well, as the title background you just saw suggests, if we are going to beat you. Now, I say that because so many good people say to me, well, I'm just an ordinary person living an ordinary life. I don't even know any communists. What can I do? Well, maybe that's what you're thinking right now. I hope so, because then you're exactly the kind of person we made this film for. To make it easy to organize and to remember our various points, I'm going to flash them on the wall, like this. What we can do. The first important thing you can do is to be sure you know what communism really is and how socialism ties in with it. In other words, know your enemy. Above all, get understanding. Know both communism and socialism for what they are and what they are not. How they operate, what their goals are, why some people are attracted to them. Well, how do you go finding out the facts? Well, like every other step I shall give you, it's easy. Once you start, why, you've made a good beginning already if you've seen the other two films in this series. That's the title of the first one, What is Communism? You'll know why J. Edgar Hoover warns it's the greatest threat in our world today. And the second film, What's the Difference Between Communism and Socialism? You'll find out that socialism is not a softer substitute or possible prevention for communism, but may lead to it. There are good books on the subject waiting for you at your public library, or at least there should be. This is only one of many sources, of course, but it's a good one, and it's near at hand. We'll touch on other sources in connection with the next thing you can do, and that is help others understand. Forget that you guys going to Marxism. The fact that you guys sort of are now kind of advocates for it and are now sort of, uh, you know, part of this, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, and pardon me, this is not an insult. I just mean part of this influencer class of people who are actively agitating from a left Marx position, like a Marxist Leninist position, right? A leftist position. That that is like, that's a pretty interesting trajectory, especially in the, in the, I don't know the scale. I mean, I guess, Carlos, you're, I don't know, you're, I think you guys are all a little bit younger than me like 10 years, sounds like 10 years or so. So like that trajectory for Eddie is really rapid, like from, you know, we're talking a few years of radicalization. Now Trump is supposed to radicalize you, like living through the Trump era should have radicalized you. So like, it's not that abnormal what you did, but in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of like the actual radicalization process, you have to now, you are now guys, you guys are now advocates of radicalization, but Marx is radicalization. So it's interesting to sort of would be here to your to sort of t get you guys to talk about how your own personal transformations into Marxists and your own sort of deeper reading into Marxist Leninism then turned into like, I got to I got to talk about this stuff. I got to turn this into a platform or I got to sort of like, where did that urge kick in? Was it just like, OK, I got to I got to just do this now? Like you said, the Midwest is definitely the heart of anti-communism um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, you know, the Red Scare took a toll on people for sure. But, you know, and I think Carlos would agree with me, one of the things we definitely noticed during the Bernie campaign when we were on the ground campaigning and knocking on doors was that all the arguments for social democracy are essentially moral arguments, right? Um, we, need to, we need to move to universal health care because all these people die because they don't have health care. You know, we need to, need to increase taxes on the rich so we can help the 78% of people who live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and then like our, our infrastructure for door knocking when we were with Bernie had us just knock on people who were registered Democrats, people who usually vote in the Democratic Party. And it was generally, you know, middle class neighborhoods, uh, more so than working class neighborhoods. So basically, the strategy of the Bernie campaign was to cast a wide net, big tent, appeal to middle class voters, uh, maybe even more so than working class voters, and then, you know, win the presidency and hopefully enact some changes from there. But what Carlos and I realized was that these arguments from the standpoint of morality to the middle class are less effective than making Marxist arguments to the working class, even though um, they've been indoctrinated with years of Red Scare propaganda. Because it is a science and because, you know, we are making um, trying to make a real analysis of the system, 
um, and giving working class people a path forward to actually improve their lives, people take to that, you know, a lot more than, you know, the the moral uh, sort of arguments that, you know, we're going to uh, struggle to improve your life directly. Um, and it's, you know, the working class versus the bourgeoisie. Uh, that was a more effective argument during the campaign than, you know, trying to appeal to people's morality, you know, going to middle class neighborhoods where everyone has health care and saying, hey, aren't you worried about the 60,000 people who die every year because they don't have access to health care? Like those people um, are well off, you know, they aren't that worried about the people who have health care. So uh, for me, that was an easy transition during the Bernie campaign from social democracy to Marxism, which I felt was just more effective on the ground when you're talking to working class people. Yeah, I'll definitely second that since we sort of hit the ground together. Um, a big part of that, the reason why we even, I think, got to the ground, it was not just the Bernie campaign, but the same professors that we both had and, and shared for those four years, they were the people that were leading the local DSA. So we would <laughs> we would see them in class during the week, and in the weekend we'd see them with like a socialism shirt and talking to people in the community. Um, so that, that's how I, I, I ended up uh, getting into the community and, and doing work. But what Eddie points out there is absolutely essential. And it's ultimately one of the reasons why we decided to do Midwestern Marks in the first place. You know, we saw that there was a clear disconnection uh, between those that called themselves socialists, uh, which mainly came through it through an educational position rather than through uh, the natural course of coming to it as a working class person. And what we realized is that there's that sort of gap, that void in between the left and the working class. And I don't know what better way to put it than with the campaign of Bernie, which quite literally had us just go to like middle, middle class educated liberals. And what we found is that we had much more success when we talked to working class people, regardless of whether they were Republican, Trump fanatics or whatever the hell. Uh, they might have been, you know, I had this conception before I started organizing that all Trump supporters were uh, racist and, and, and bigoted and all these things. And what I quickly realized was that when you talk to these people and they heard the slogan, make America great again, I mean, we know it's a bullshit slogan, right? And there was never a great America. But there was an America at one point uh, with their parents or their grandparents where one job was enough. Uh, their grandparents were in labor unions that, you know, wouldn't be corrupt and were led by communists and people who had genuine interest in advancing the interest short term and long term of the working class. So they think back to a time when America, at least for, you know, a portion of the working class population provided, you know, a good uh, living standard. And of course, there's geopolitical reasons to analyze why that was the case and, and struggles and organizations that must go into it. But what we found was that precisely what Eddie mentioned, when we bring up the moralistic arguments, which is it's the forefront for social Democrats, right? For social Democrats, what you're focusing on is already the point of distribution. You're already one step off, like your, your starting point is already off because you're focusing on distribution and what you should be focusing on is on production. So already from the discourse itself, the language that you use, the language that they would call uh, handout language, right? You're talking about handouts or you're talking about uh, these sort of distributive policies that the only way to argue for them is through morality. Now, if you shift the focus to the step before that, that which determines that distributive uh, realm or moment, that's how Marx talks about it, and you focus on production, you're focusing on something that is one more directly related to uh, working class people's everyday experience. And two, you're focusing on something that doesn't require too moralistic of arguments. We got to remember that we're dealing with imperfect people. We're dealing with subjects that capitalism has formed, conditioned, and socialized into being atomized and monadic individuals, right? Um, but that is the only working class we have. We can't just magically draw a new one up and make that one the revolutionary class. I mean, now there, I've been seeing the memes all day of these rodents in Argentina, and people are putting like the Che Guevara. Uh, little thing on it. You know, we can't just grab a new species and make it the revolutionary agent of history. We have to work with what we have, and they're going to have imperfections, but we have to address them where they're at. And we found that talking about the productive sphere, leaving the moralistic arguments aside, and just talking about the relations of power that go into play when they step in, uh, when they step into work, 
that's the best route. And what ends up happening is that once they open up, yeah, of course they care. They have to care because they have families and, you know, their individualism is contrary to to how the species has had to adapt in order to develop. So you have to break through that, but you don't break through it by directly going to moralistic arguments. You get them to open up, you go to a commensurable position with their everyday life, and then maybe you can talk about, hey, let's, what about these things or, or connect why it is that this bigger picture, why it is that caring about other people uh, is interrelated to the advancement of your direct condition as a working class person. Theoretically, I mean, the early, the young Engels, already in uh, 1844, was sending a letter. There's a letter that was sent to Marx, um, and one of our other editors on the project, Mitch, shared it a couple of days ago. It was a letter on uh, Max Stirner's text about the ego, and he makes a comment there that's quite interesting and that relates to this, which is that uh, the natural conclusion of egoism is communism. It might seem contradictory. But if you genuinely want the best outcome for yourself, you have to come to the realization that the best outcome for yourself is tied to the best outcome for the community. So we approached workers in a way that hit production, that hit their direct material interests. And from there, we were able to extend ourselves into the moral arguments that help them understand how it is that the interest of everyone, not just the U.S., but the interest of the working class, the international working class was also tied to their interest. Yeah, I think what, uh, for me, what kind of brought me to like, I guess more like revolutionary Marxism instead of like reformism was just like, so I've been working in kitchens for probably about over a decade now. And just kind of like talking with the people I worked with, they pretty much all like instinctually felt that, you know, most politicians, at least in the US were um, entirely full of shit and that the electoral process probably wasn't the best way to go. And for me, it was kind of like, I also supported um, Bernie in the last couple of elections. And I, you know, I feel okay about that, fine. But I feel like a lot of the argument kind of like something that I don't really like about is I prefer not to like water down our ideology to like something that is more like uh, for a mass appeal. I like want to kind of like say what we mean and um, like just consistently advocate that and try and like educate people in that way instead of like, trying to like just make go for like a mass appeal um, and not like be afraid of like turning people off by what we genuinely believe. So like something I always find funny, like when I like go after or like talk about social Democrats in the US in like a negative way is people will be like, why are you going after them? I'm like, well, I'm not a social Democrat and they don't really want what I want. So of course I don't really like them that much. So I guess it's kind of like my opinion on it. All three of you sort of touched on this again. I'm going to return to it. I kind of mentioned it in my last rambling question, but the, you know, the three of you all have your own sort of trajectory to Marxism. It's not like mine. Let me put it that way. Mine was through university, through school, was always through mediated through the bourgeois intellectual academic class, which which uh, the predominant majority of like Marxist publica publications you've heard of people out there are connected to bourgeois academics in universities and also not even generally and in only so only a few corners of universities too generally right like part of the results of generations of anti-communism is a real a sort of purge of communists from the universities and from the sort of professional realm and i know that from experience from just seeing the kinds of people who go from grad go to grad schools in the us at least the people that I hung out with in grad school, I mean, that says something about where I came from. But the sort of question I want to take this to is that you guys don't seem, and based on my readings of Midwestern Marx and your videos and the sort of YouTube stuff, you guys generally don't have the same fetishization of theory that a lot of other Marxists, and in, including myself, I'm happy to put myself in that, in that camp, seem to betray, right? Is that, am I wrong? Am I off? Is that on purpose? Is that, is that an accident? What, what, who, who, can, who can answer that? First off, I just want to say to your uh, point about, you know, the bourgeois character of communism in the U.S. kind of due to the, the, the nature of the academy is, is also part of the reason that we do what we do. So Carlos mentioned during the Bernie campaign how our professors were advocating for socialist stuff in their off time. I wanted to add that was some of our professors. Uh, we had a very, you know, we, we had a lot of awesome professors, including one who's a writer for our site now who um, studied in China um, and got his PhD in Chinese politics, uh, um, big into Marxist thought and stuff. 
you know, and he was great and he inspired us a lot. But there were also a lot of professors who, you know, seemed to have the same morality as me um, in our discussions in class. But then they were out, you know, supporting Pete Buttigieg or, or <laughs> knocking on doors for Cory Booker and then running for local office, using their platform as a teacher to run for local office and looking for an endorsement from these corporate national level candidates who they campaigned for. Um, so, you know, in a way that showed me how full of shit a lot of the academy is um, and it pushed me towards Marxism. And then to your question about theory, I think for us, you know, theory is is important. Uh, extremely important. And we all, you know, spend a ton of time reading, but it's important in in what it can teach us for practice. You know, the best theory comes from practice. And the only theory that's of any use to us is that um, which can bring about revolution and which can bring about material change on the ground. I mean, that's the whole point of writing theory. So, you know, we're not interested in in reading theory so we can flex on people or whatever. Um, uh, it seems like, you know, in the in the age of social media with Marxism, um, it, it becomes a little bit like that, right? Like everybody's just trying to flex how much they know and how much they've read. Uh, I did a podcast with Hugh Gopnik, a, a really good YouTuber the other day. And he said he has a theory that nobody's actually read Capital Volume 1. Everyone just pretends they do. Um, so that's that's my take on it, at least, is that, you know, a lot of people like to pretend they've read theory. Um, but theory is very, very hard and very, very complex. But it can be very, very useful if you actually take the time to understand it. So that's our whole goal is to take the time to understand it and then translate it to people, um, working class people especially, so they can understand it. Because a lot of these books were written a long time ago. A lot of them are really complex. Um, but as I said, we believe in, you know, this we believe in this revolutionary theory. We believe in, in building a path to socialism um, and that that these uh, these theoretical texts from people who have tried to construct socialism in the past can help us. So one of our main goals you know, is to translate theory um, for the working class. And one of the main things we try and avoid is is being like those uh, um, kind of faux Marxists who flex how much they've read. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's telling to the poverty of theory today that when you do the sort of theory that's from a proletarian uh, class position and guided towards proletarian interest-related ends, it almost comes off as if it's not really theory, right? It's almost like instinctually we relate to theory in such a way so that theory has to be that which doesn't relate to practice. Like we draw this binary of theory and practice and they're each in their own corner. Um, and what our project tries to do is not like avoid theory. We want people to read, not just read our articles or, or listen to our lectures about books. We want people to actually read. We want to bring that culture back. If we genuinely believe in communism, we believe that, you know, we don't just need to liberate ourselves in the sense of being able to labor as we want. But part of genuine human labor is being able to do it in a planned and a conscious way to develop all of our capacities to uh, the highest level possible. And that involves reading theory, not just reading Marxist theory, reading all sorts of theory, right? Reading everything, reading the history of philosophy. I may be a little biased here, but it's telling to the poverty of contextual theory that when one does theory from the perspective of a working class person or just generally theory that's tied to practice, it almost comes off as if it's something other than theory, right? Um, like if it's, you know, it's just merely political analysis. And what I want to underscore, uh, even though I'm the one, you know, sort of doing philosophy, most of Eddie's like TikTok videos or YouTube uh, uh, videos and political analysis those are philosophical uh, works like th that when you contextualize something in its history, when you demonstrate what's all of the factors that go around it, that's what critical philosophy does. Critical philosophy asks, what is presupposed in this? What are the limits to which this can get me towards? And we ask that about social democracy. What are the limits of social democracy? What is presupposed in a capitalism that gives us the alternative to challenge it? as social democracy. What is presupposed in all of this? And even though it comes out like as something other than theory or, or for my, uh, uh, for my uh, specific bias as something other than philosophy, I consider that to be philosophy and theory. What the other guys are doing in the academy, they're just, you know, <laughs> doing some weird sort of intellectual masturbation. Um, just one big circle jerk where they all just fucking uh, do things for the sake of putting that in the CV. 
the other day I was asked to to do something and I had to do a CV for it. And it was almost one of the most disgusting experiences of my life. I had to create this thing where I, it, and and ever since I did it, it's like everything new that I published, it, on the back of my mind, it's like, oh, the CV, how am I going to put this on the CV? It's despicable. It's the commodification of academia. Um, and our project tries to move away from that, not by like rejecting theory, but embracing a theory that's connected to, that comes from and goes back into practice. I hope every person who goes to an Ivy League school heard that. Everyone in the academy is just jerking off, but me on TikTok, that's the real theory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love our swagger. God bless you guys. God bless the youth of tomorrow. Um, Alex, do you have do you have uh, anything to do you have do you have something to say to that answer? Um, I think that pretty much got it, but I just think like one thing we try and like at least something I like try and avoid doing is like just getting like too focused on theory and too focused on like take making it too abstract. I kind of like feel like we try and focus on also talking about like real shit that's going on in the world. Like, so that's how like, I focus like a lot on Palestine and that sort of stuff. So I think like a lot of us, we like also try and focus on like what's happening in real events, especially like anti imperialism and stuff like that's going on with the US empire. Just kind of like, uh, just kind of doing a status report on that sort of stuff. Something like yeah. we try and like mix those sorts of things as well. Sorry, Alex, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to add that for me, one of the things I always try and do is read a history book alongside of whatever theory book I'm reading. Um, and I was going to say, you know, that's what Alex does really, really well um, as sort of taking the history angle um, on our website is is translates that theory into historical practice. There's that one quote like, you know, you can only study history for so long and then you either have to become a Marxist or become a liar. So, you know, a lot of what what Alex does is explains, you know, uh, explains history through a Marxist theoretical lens. And that makes it a lot, a lot easier for people to understand Marxism, but then a lot easier for people to also understand, you know, history. So one thing I wondered, I want to follow up quickly with you, Carlos, because I wanted to know, and you as a philosopher side of you, the, the, the turn towards deconstruction, the so-called linguistic turn, post-structuralism, right? These are all kind of various kind of intertwined movements or, I don't know, interrelated kind of nodes of, of historical sort of intellectual work that have come together in the last few decades or several decades, I guess, by now. I mean, the, the Derrida paper at, at Hopkins is like 60-something, right? So it's, it's maybe it's later. I don't know, actually. But, I mean, who cares? It doesn't matter. But part, I was wondering about you specifically in terms of like, have you, do you, do you think that there is a kind of deleterious effect of specifically the French, French theory on, on the American left, the U.S. sort of Western Anglo left? Because I'm increasingly seeing that as the case. I don't know. Well, um, what's funny is that if you would have asked me this question, like before last semester started, I would have said, these guys are all, uh, psyops are all, you know, funded by the State Department and MI6. And I would have started citing the Congress for Cultural Freedom and all the people that funded them. And I still think they, I, I still think they serve a purpose to capital as a pocket towards which, um, um, a pocket towards which those that are discontent land in so that they don't substantially oppose the system. But here's the thing. Um, Analyzing it materially, this turn towards the micro, and you see it with Foucault focusing on the clinic, uh, focusing on prisons, right? This turn away from uh, concrete analysis of productive forces or just the political in general. This turn comes about in a historical moment where the left is falling, both in, in Europe and, and in the U.S. So it's almost natural that if your material conditions change the way you do theory, changes right and that's not to take away from the fact that it still genuinely uh aids capital to have the sort of people that would express discontent in 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 a marxist uh, lingo or marxist leninist lingo express it through like derrida or foucault and you know that's the uh, radicalism qua radicalism in academia right now but i still think that some of the work they do is helpful take for instance foucault once you have the process of enclosure, uh, which sets up the precondition for the possibility of the development of capitalism, uh, where do those people go? What happens to those people? Well, 
they either join the military in order to serve as the direct agents of imperialism, imperialism in the pre-Lenin sense. They end up at a psychiatric hospital or clinic, or they end up in prison, right? So with the work of Foucault, for, for instance, who's probably the, the father head of, of this, uh, this whole movement towards postmodernism and post-structuralism, uh, I think there's a way of reading Foucault uh, as, uh, as a, a way of reading Foucault that's beneficial for Marxists, that helps us analyze, well, what, while Marx is describing what's happening to the productive forces and to the relations of production, Foucault is describing what's happening in these usually ignored areas of the superstructure and why they play an influence in the development of the productive forces and what influence it is that they play. So I think that we have to read these people, if, if we do, we have to read them with a critical eye and also read them, which is something that I wasn't doing for a long time, not read them with the standard of them being Marxist. As someone who is in philosophy, I'm always reading non-Marxist people. But when I approach people that are non-Marxist, I know I'm not approaching a Marxist. My standard is lowered and I am able to take away what process that standard and what I think to be helpful. When we engage with these post-structuralist and post-modernist, since academia has had this aura around them that they're the radical ones, uh, we engage with them usually from the Marxist traditions as if they're Marxist. And I, I think that's a big mistake. We have to understand them as non-Marxist uh, thinkers of this sort of left that capitalism has been able to create. And in doing so, we can take parts of their analysis and, and, and fill it into our, uh, our general project and our system. But it, it's a dual effect because if you fall too into it, then, you know, you're in the trap, right? You've made it into the pocket of the left wing pocket of, of capital. So I, yeah, I didn't want this to turn I'm into like a, into an, I didn't want to turn into like a, a referendum on theory, but I just wondered because you're in philosophy and yeah. philosophy is famously pretty, is pretty hostile to European theory. I mean, they, they think that like, I mean, that's the thing, like, that's how conservative a lot of academia is that like for many philosophy, philosophy departments, like Nietzsche is like too radical. Like you could never, like you don't learn Marx in an economic, in an economics department. Like there's like one, I think there's like that guy in Utah somewhere or like a few scattered places here or there, but you definitely don't learn in economics. You definitely don't learn in political theory. If you do, like it's the one freak guy that they get to teach. So it's just, it's just, you know, it's interesting that the, one of these developments of, of left thinking in the U S and in English in general, because of the influence of the U S is this weird result of the demarxification, if you want to say of higher education and the sort of a part of the sort of cleansing of U.S. public life and media life and discursive life of all kind of communist thinking and anti-capitalist thinking, because ultimately it's a reactionary country. I was going to say is, um, well, they were French, so there's that. We can't really trust them. But um, <laughs> I was going to just like on to something, uh, on to something <laughs> Carlos said, um, just like I think like the importance of reading people that like disagree with you, like in history, I read like a lot of the books I read are history books by historians that I disagree with. And I think that's like something that's pretty important, not just because, you know, you do see like another different perspective, but also it kind of like gives you like an idea of like what other sides of arguments are, but also just because you can get like, if you, as long as you know how to like, I think a very important thing is developing like critical reading and being able to like read between the lines and just kind of like subvert, like maybe sometimes an author's um, intentions and like get information that uh, is helpful to you. So I think that's like something that's also really important for us to do. I couldn't agree more with um, what those guys said. And right now I'm reading a book called The New Class War by Michael Lind, who's like a, almost like a neocon. Um, like Alex said, to you know, get a critical reading out of it and take what's good from it. But I will say um, there was like, there's been like a neo-Marxist trend on TikTok, you know, and it's a lot of young people. Um, and right away, my reaction to it was, yeah, read all these French Marxists, you know, try and glean what you can from them. Just make sure you also read Marx, make sure you also read the basics. And I thought that would be fine. And what it's basically turned into is a bunch of 16 year olds uh, who are really into French philosophy, like making fun of people for calling themselves revolutionaries. And like, they'll tweet or comment at our website and be like, you guys are unsophisticated, anti-intellectual thinkers. I'm like, shut the hell up. You guys are 16. I spent so many hours reading Capital this summer. I do not want to hear a 16-year-old tell me, like, I don't understand theory. 
um, as if he's read, you know, the entire works of Marx and then moved on to to uh, Foucault and Althusser um, uh, before even hitting the age of, of 20. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a little bit dangerous because Carlos says people fall into these pockets. Um, and especially going back to that trend I was talking about earlier where Marxism is is more popular, but now people kind of uh, use it on social media as like a flex. You know, this is how much I know. This is how intellectual I am. Um, and, and for me, just, you know, spending a lot of time on TikTok with young people, that's the main way that I've seen this, uh, um, you know, uh, whatever you would call it, like French neo-Marxist thought or whatever. That's how I've seen it manifested. Uh, maybe that's a good segue for our for to talk a little bit about the actual social media work, because you guys media operation is is really fun, is really quite something. You guys have a you guys have a website. You guys have a YouTube channel. You have a Instagram page. You have the sort of regular socials, except your TikTok seems to be in in combination with your website. At least they're paired in the sense of the TikTok seems to be the place where you get the most engagement, become the most uh, sort of reach the most reach the highest number of of people who then draw you into the wider project of Midwestern Marx. Is that is that kind of how it works or how do you guys approach it? Who runs the TikTok? Is it just you, Eddie, or do you guys all share it? Yeah, well, after I got banned, we made one called Midwestern Marx. So we're hoping now that that we'll all post on that one and then I'll use the I'll just continue using my Eddie Liger account. But yeah, that's kind of how it works uh, or how it's worked so far. We just whatever the TikTok algorithm just let us blow up kind of um, until recently when they banned us. But um, still, like when we post on there, just for whatever reason, it gets a lot of engagement. Um, what yeah. What happened with the Sorry, banning? Go ahead. Oh, the banning? Yeah. Like what happened? Is <laughs> Are you asking? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't I mean, we don't really know, but. There's there was this guy. He's like a, a Colombian um, sort of of anti-communist liberal who does like half celebrity gossip videos, half half like history videos. And he he found me when I was talking about Venezuela and obviously supporting the Bolivarian Revolution and supporting socialism in Venezuela and, and shit talking the blockade. Um, and, and he started posting a bunch of videos like, oh, you know, Hugo Chavez's daughter is the richest woman in Venezuela and the Chavez family has all their money. Um, and that's the reason why they're poor. You know, the blockade has nothing to do with it. The, the ruling class Socialist Party is just hoarding it all. Um, so we started going back and forth. And then this dude like became obsessed with us or, or me, at least, especially during the SOS Cuba protests. Uh, people have counted it up. He has more than 100 videos on me now. And the person has over 400,000 subscribers. Um, so people started like mass reporting the account. It got banned for three weeks in a row. Um, and then I made one video defending myself from this guy. And then our the account was gone, permanently banned after I made one video about the dude. So we're like, is this guy a psyop or what is going on? We didn't know. But then a couple days later, after, you know, massive outpouring of support from the, the followers that we've gotten so far tiktok reinstated the account and then reinstated that video um responding to that guy um and yeah now we're back up i guess but we'll see going forward well this is interesting actually this is uh, this raises an interesting point i mean so we we build these platforms right and i include myself in this like we we you know it's obvious to say we're not part of some sort of the establishment, if anything, we're very hostile to the establishment. So you build these platforms outside of the mainstream on social media, which is precisely what social media is for, uh, doing doing exactly what social media was intended to do. And you have this massive following. You do exactly what you don't play dirty. You don't like you don't go looking for cheap follows. You obviously have this big following. You know, you generate a lot of interaction, which is what these companies want. By the way, they want people to be mad at you online. It helps them. That outrage machine is very much, they're very much tuned into it and they monetize it. So, so it doesn't make any sort of financial sense to ban you guys. But however, here's the thing, like we are all subject to these draconian media companies now. Like we all build, we all have these platforms, myself included, uh, and we need these companies to keep our message out. Like the moment, the moment they want to stop me, they can they can just reach out to my American provider and be like, yo, you want to stop this guy now? I have to really do something to like get them on my case. Like my show is pretty small and I thankfully have never been viral in my sh like podcast is slightly different. It's pretty, 
like you have to go after a podcast to really hate listen to it. I think that it's unique that way and it's doesn't attract the same kind of culture of degeneracy that say like certain like YouTube videos do. So it's kind of different. Maybe we can get into that. But I guess my question is, you know, do we live and die by the social media sword in a way that, you know, okay, they're just going to, we're going to be fucking, we're going to be fucking exposed to these ridiculous uh, campaigns. And one day, like the gray zone guys, the gray zone guys are actively delisted by like their search, their search their You can tell like they're, 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 they're you know, they're not allowed to, they're, let me put it this way. Like you can tell that, that the, that the media companies are working extra hard to make sure they don't have more influence than they do right now. We could talk about the concept of influence later, but I'm just wondering have, what's the, like, what's the thinking around this? Like, are you, is it just, you know, this is, this is the reality. Like we're not going to start another YouTube, another Instagram, another TikTok. Oh, uh, yeah. So I think for me, it was like, I just kind of like started my, my, like my page just because I was in the South and I didn't really have anybody to talk about like Marxism too. So I just kind of like was, did it for fun to like start the page and like just post books I was reading and just stuff like that. But it kind of like, it kind of just like grew from there. But like, I don't know, for me, it's like, I like want the page to grow because like, I want like people to get like the information and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, like a lot of the stuff I do, I post, I post like kind of for me. And like maybe like some of like my friends follow me like so I don't know even if like even when I'm like I notice like my traffic goes down thirty percent or something like that I'm like whatever I'll just post through it just because it's something that like I enjoy doing it's something that I'm interested in so I don't know these like these month like they can come after uh, my page all they want and it doesn't really matter to me I'm just gonna keep posting because I enjoy it it's it's interesting hearing Alex talk about it because Carlos and I talk about this all the time because you know there's not a clear path forward, even in the Marxist tradition, right? Lenin didn't write anything about social media. So if we believe that good theory comes from practice, it's that applies to social media too. So we have to continue learning as we grow. But I guess one thing we've always recognized with the project is that the bigger we are, the harder it'll be for them to take us down. So like part of what I think happened uh, when when the TikTok got banned um, was, and, and the Cuban government proved this, was the State Department was funneling money into like these troll farms which has been a new technique of the CIA and, and the State Department. They actually did it during the Arab Spring, uh, funneled a bunch of money into propaganda uh, to try and control the narrative through um, social media. So clearly, you know, it's important. It, it matters in some way if it's, if it's important enough for the State Department to be funneling money into it. Um, and, and I think during SOS Cuba, a lot of those bot accounts were probably the reason that our TikTok account got taken down. Um, but then, like you said, we got put back up and, and maybe that's because, you know, we make a lot of money for TikTok. And like Alex said, if you keep posting, like we got banned um, and then the, the other account we made had over 10,000 followers within a week. It's like if you don't do the clickbaity stuff and you give people content that they want to continuously come back to, which, you know, Alex's Instagram is, is the exact same. Uh, it, it's great content, um, a great history that you constantly want to keep coming back to real knowledge that isn't just uh, clickbaity nonsense. Um, yeah, I don't know. You build we at least we've been able to build an audience who keeps coming back, I guess, even if these these tech companies do take us down. So, uh, yeah, it, it just is what it is. Carlos, did you want to add to that? Yeah, well. Yeah, I, I was going to say that uh, there's a balance there. It's funny, Eddie, you mentioned that. Uh, you grow to a size where it's hard for them to do something to you. And I think that was definitely a reason why the TikTok came back out of nowhere. It had to have been, you know, the uh, tens of thousands of people uh, on Twitter, you know, um, condemning TikTok for it. But it's it's almost as if, like, we, we recognize that all of these instruments are instruments of capital. That they'll let us dance around for a little bit. Um, but once we become a threat, once we grow to a size that's substantial, that's when they'll jump in. Um, now, sometimes, right, we're so big that they jump in and it's very clearly um, a case of repression that we haven't done anything wrong and, you know, people fight back. But uh, we have to technically be on our toes as much as possible because I think we're getting to a size on social media that um, any slight, you know, fuck up, they're always going to use it against us to remove us, right? And we'll restart, but we'll end up in a sort of myth of Sisyphus situation where we get to a certain size, the rock 
falls back again, and we're perpetually trying to get to the size that uh, at which point we get to it, we end up getting rebanned or something. So I think there's no uh, there's no shortcut to organizing on the ground, specifically doing economic organizing. And one of the things we urge our audience constantly is that yes, enjoy our videos and our content and our uh, journals and everything, but do work in your community uh, if you don't have a workplace. If you have a workplace, organize your workplace, try to unionize your workplace and build from there. Um, but if you don't have a workplace or it's, you know, more of a precari precarious situation that you're in, you know, organize in the community, that's where they can't repress you in the same way that they can uh, in social media. They can do it in other ways, but it's not a thing where like us after 360,000 followers, they just say, here, fuck it, you're gone. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, um, I think another important thing we um, try and do is kind of like uh, amplify the voices of like. I guess more marginalized people like I've uh, like specifically like colonized people and try and like, I think that's like also important for us to do um, to try and like make that, like make those issues more visible for people. Thank you, fellas. Thank you so much. I don't know if you're hearing this. Do you hear this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for having us on. Thank you, Sina. Yes. Thanks thank a lot. you so much. This is awesome. Oh, could I, uh, when you upload it, do you mind if I, I put it on our YouTube or? No, of course not. No, of course not. I'm happy. I'm happy that you, that you guys want to share it. I actually, yeah, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop the recording. We can keep talking.